This week, we interview Barry Stein from the Cigar Authority. In our Debonair Ideal segment, we're going to talk about IPCPR cigar etiquette. And in our Stogies of the Week, we'll probably talk more about IPCPR, as well as some five-pack small cigars that are you smoke on the go. We're going to talk about candela wrap cigars. We're going to talk about extremely rare cigars, expensive cigars, and probably some budget cigars as well. All that and more, so stay tuned. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the Stogie Geek Show. Duran Premium Cigars is one of the fastest growing boutique cigar companies, providing smokers a portal into the old Cuban tradition of perfect balance and the lost art of progressive flavor construction. Roberto Paleo Duran began his career in tobacco over two decades ago in Havana, where his reputation grew within Cuban circles. The creation of Duran Premium Cigars has given Roberto the platform to introduce a series of cigars that offers the same quality, construction, and detail which he perfected while in Cuba. Brands include the Ultra Premium Roberto P. Duran Premium Cigar Series, Azan Cigars, Naya, and Baracoa. Duran Cigars uses a seed-to-humidor approach as all tobacco is grown on their farms and rolled in their factory in Esteli, Nicaragua. Rollers have been carefully chosen to carry out Roberto's precise method to carry out Roberto's precise method to ensure the progressive flavor in each cigar. Duran Cigars invites you to make their premium your standard. Havana Cigar Club, located in Warwick, Rhode Island, is a great place to enjoy a drink and a cigar. Stogie Geeks listeners can find a $5 off coupon on our website by clicking the HCC logo. M. Bombay Cigars represent the most admired cigar culture of Cuba. They select the best of the best quality tobacco to use in the aging process. M. Bombay Cigars are then rolled in Costa Rica by some of the most experienced cigar rollers, giving it a unique smoking experience. The band portrays the detailed and artistic nature of our small industry. Try the M. Bombay Casera, M. Bombay Mora, and the recently released M. Bombay Habano. M. Bombay Cigars where the cigar is a way of life. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the Stogie Geek Show. This is episode... Is this episode 148? 149. 149. Wow, we're almost at episode 150, Will. I am so excited to be here in Rhode Island. Will Cooper is on the lines in North Carolina. Welcome, Will. Hey, greetings. Um, Will, I, I, just a couple of notes before we get started. I uh, have been drinking a lot of Defiant whiskey. <laughs> Wait, didn't you just get your shipment yesterday? Uh, yeah, <laughs> and a lot of the bottles are, are not very full anymore. <laughs> I've been uh, doing a lot of sampling. I have to make sure that it's you know, a quality product and one that we stand behind, and I can absolutely say with certainty that I, I stand behind this product. It drinks to me, Will, more like scotch. It has that, this smokiness to it that uh, is one of the characteristics that I, I would say I've grown to love. So um, props to Defiant Whiskey. I tried mixing one cocktail with it. Now, everyone said it came out great. It wasn't quite up to my standards yet. But uh, I will be working on, with, uh, again, with my fellow mixologists uh, here in studio, a cocktail that will use this whiskey. <coughs> My first attempt, again, a lot of people drank it and said it was very good. Um, it wasn't quite up to my standards yet, so we're going to go back to the drawing board. Again, it was only my first attempt, uh, and, it, it, you know, and they, they said it was still good. But uh, I've just been drinking it straight, man. Like, not even rocks or anything, just straight whiskey, which can get you in trouble. Um, I think I've managed to stay out of trouble for the most part. Um, but I've been enjoying it with a, a wide range of cigars, and I really like it, Will. Yeah, and if, for folks who don't know, um, I think folks who do listen to the show know I'm not the drinker. Um, I came across this product through a friend, and I really liked it. And this friend happened to be someone who spent a long time in the cigar business. Um, we got started talking, and you know, just some of the things we're doing on the show – um, they really want, they wanted to give us the support. Um, I had drank this product a lot, and um, 
I was confident enough that Paul would like this product. Um, it's 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 a whiskey that that I'm not a whiskey drinker, but I drink this this whiskey. Um, and a lot of people said that too. I gave it to one of my friends last night, and he's like, "I'm not really a whiskey drinker," but he said, "You know, this drinks more like scotch, and it's got that smoking component that you typically find in scotch," and he really liked it. So yeah, it's not a peaty scotch, which I've no, learned. No, smoke and I, peat are two different <laughs> flavors. A lot of times they'll be combined in 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 one, but this is definitely a smoky, and it's very subtle too. It's not overpowering. It's very subtle. Yeah, I, I would I would definitely agree. I think it's got a little bit of this vanilla note too in there that really it just kind of smoothed out the whole thing as well with that smokiness in there. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Will's coming off the heels of IPCPR. So uh, stay tuned. We're going to be talking about that this evening as well. Um, we've got a fellow podcaster and blogger on the line, Mr. Barry Stein from the Cigar Authority. Those of you may recognize Barry from that show. Uh, of course, the, the store is not too far from here uh, in, in New Hampshire. Uh, so, Barry, welcome to the show. I appreciate you guys having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So, Barry, how did you get started in the cigar industry? Well, back in 1998, I was partners in a cigar shop in Brooklyn, New York that still exists uh, called The Humidor. Um, I had to sell the store. Along with my business partner in approximately 2002, uh, when he was one of the lead investigators for the TV show America's Most Wanted, Uh, and he brought me on board to do a lot of his computer research. So we were on the road more than we were in the store, wound up selling it. I wound up missing the camaraderie of a cigar shop because you could take a white collar worker and a blue collar worker and all of a sudden they're equals. doesn't matter if you were making six figures or struggling to get by on a daily basis, you were all brothers of the leaf. So I started writing for Smoke Magazine. I was one of their panelists for reviewers. Um, I met Sam Lucia uh, when Nub had first started up and he uh, told me I should start blogging. I laughed, I shrugged it off. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wound up giving me a box of cigars. Here's your first review and your first giveaway. So I wound up blogging, started doing a CigarSmoker.com. From there, I got hired as a uh, consultant for Miami Cigar Company, which turned into a full-time gig. Uh, Miami Cigar and Company and I eventually mutually parted ways. I I came back to the Northeast. Uh, Long story short, too late at that point, but I went to work for Dave Garofalo at Two Guys Smoke Shop, which is in Nashua, Salem, and Seabrook, New Hampshire. So Excellent. I got to talk to you about that place, the Humidor. I've been there. It's mm-hmm. um, in, it's in Bay Ridge, and yep. I, it is. I think it was after you owned it, Barry, because my aunt doesn't live too far from there, and it is just a classic Brooklyn cigar shop. Is all I'll, yes. I'll just say. So you talk about people coming from different walks of life, but it's a great place. I, I love it actually. Yeah. When I go in there, four hundred fifty square feet. Um, the the shop, even though it was owned by cops, kind of had this mystique about it. And the then Brooklyn DA, uh, Charles Hines, he would take the express bus from the courts that would let him off right right on the corner of the humidor. He would get out of the bus, cross the street, walk across, and then cross, come back, just so he wouldn't be photographed in front of the cigar shop because he was under the impression that it was owned by unsavory types. So it was a little bit of a reputation. I mean, we had people come in here, oh, wow, you guys actually sell cigars. But it was <laughs> cop-owned, and every walks of life hung out in the place. You know, it, like I said, you know, different backgrounds, different people that come together for the, the one thing they enjoy, and it happens to be cigars. Yep. Now, Barry, I, you know, I have a, a pretty strong background in technology. You know, I've been around computers and actually programming since I was uh, seven years old. And so when I first started really getting into cigars, I was big into the blog scene. because so like, this is a great way to get information. Uh, tell me what it was like in the, the early days of uh, when you started your blog. Well, it, I had a CigarSmoker.com, which I eventually had sold to Kevin Page when I went to work for Miami Cigar. And to this day, he owns it. But there was more of a, a sense of a brotherhood. It still exists today to a degree. I mean, a guy like Coop, you know, he, he's part of that community but it was more like we weren't trying to beat everybody to the story we were trying to all work together to further the passion and the hobby that we had for cigars now it's become a little bit flooded there's a lot of cigar sites out there 
We've developed kind of a bad rep over the years that we're trying to clean up, that Coop's trying to clean up a little bit with the Cigar Media Association. But to me, it was simpler and easier when I originally started the blog. I mean, when I originally started the blog, there was only Stogie, uh, Stogie Guys, mm-hmm. uh, Stogie Review, right. and myself. And there were a few other guys. I mean, there was, uh, I forget the guy's name, Cigar, Cigar Inspector, I think it was. Yep, yep. He's and, still, I think he's still, is he still blogging? He's not blogging. Um, I think other people are writing for the sites, but yeah. it's going. It goes numerous weeks between reviews, and uh, I well, think I was. I was a huge fan, and still am a huge fan of the A Cigar Smoker blog. I mean, that was one of the ones I would read on a regular basis to get uh, information about cigars, and that's really how I. That's really Barry. How I got into doing a cigar podcast was I started reading all of the blogs, then I started listening to podcasts, and you know I've done a computer security podcast. This is our tenth year. And I said, you know, I, I need to do a podcast. So it was really the new cigar media that was emerging that kind of thrust me into doing what I do today. So partly you're responsible for that. Well, <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> you know, you guys do it the right way. I'm glad that you're um, part of the, the blogging team, so to speak. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're brothers that just take our hobby and our interest to the next level. If people are crazy enough to listen to us and watch us, hey, more power to them. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's been a fun ride. It's been a, you know, it's been a long, long time. Yeah. So you're still, um, you're still blocking today for the cigar authority, right? Basically this, you know, you you fell in love with the cigar smoker. I was the original writer. You know, I was the guy behind the site for five years. That style of blogging has now followed us to the cigar authority.com. You know, when you're done reading cigar coop and you want to look for a different, a different view or a different take. When you're done with his site, come on over to our site, but make sure you go back to Coop at the end of the day. I try to steal any, you know, any readers or any listeners. You know, at the end of the day, we're we're all in it for the same reason. And like I said a few times already, not to sound like a broken record, it's the passion. No, it, like I said, Barry, you know, I've been doing this for ten years, and uh, I've been a producer of the content, and I've also been a consumer of the content in blogs and podcasts and videos, and I like having the diversity. And when it, you talk about cigars, I liked being able to read the reviews of a particular cigar from different person's perspective. And it would actually help me. I knew that if you wrote a positive review and Coop wrote a positive review and the Stogie guys wrote a positive review, like that was definitely a cigar that I wanted to go buy. So you can kind of use it as kind of a litmus test as to which cigars you want to go try that you haven't tried before. And I think that's one of the great things about the community that we're building around cigar media. I, I agree with that because I know, you know what they say about opinions, you know, everybody has them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when you got more than one person sharing the same opinion, now there's some validity to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Barry, it's good because um, we may have different approaches to what we do, but I think there's two common denominators. There's the passion of cigars, and I think the other thing is the passion of the media piece. And I think that's where a lot of these guys who get into this, they may love cigars, but when they get into the media piece, they and I've seen it happen, they don't have that passion. No. And, and I mean, yeah, and you've for, I mean, you've come back now for over a year and a half, and I mean, you're you're doing content just about daily right now, and, and you know that's a lot of work, you know. It, it it is. I mean, some days there's eight articles, nine articles, and uh, you're trying to you know juggle that with you know my job, you know my my primary job is actually doing the web the web end for twoguyscigars.com and doing the social media for United Cigar Group, a little bit for Selected Tobacco. You know, Nelson's his own animal. I got this cigar that I blended that I worked to come out with Noel Rojas from, from Guayacan. So it's a matter of being able to juggle all these different hats that I've been wearing the last month and a half. And I'm blessed that David, you know, David Garofalo, the owner of all the aforementioned uh, sites and, and outlets, has pretty much given me free reign to do what I've been doing. You know, sometimes we might butt heads and we might not see eye to eye. But what, what boss and what employee ever sees 100% eye to eye? So well, no, that's the beauty of it, is being able to to have those disagreements and and still move on and and achieve right. the same goal. You're not always going to agree. Yeah. So 100%. Now, yeah, Barry, do you work? Uh, do you get to spend a lot of time in the stores? Well, I work in Nashua, uh, the mm-hmm. Nashua location. Uh, Salem's the main location. It's you know it's the number one store in terms of volume and what have you. Mm-hmm. But Nashua is the distribution point. It's the distribution point for all three stores. 
And also there's a the distribution <coughs> excuse me, there's a the distribution point for United Cigar Group and there's the distribution point for selected tobacco. Um, so mostly I'm working in the back office. I'm not on the sales floor. Mm -hmm. um, I could be a little bit rough. I could be a little bit of abrasive. I'm a New Yorker. I'm living in New Hampshire. <laughs> it's a whole different animal. Uh, so I'm, I'm like the man behind the curtain. So now wait, what is United Cigar Group? United Cigar Group is a group that was started by David Garofalo who was a little upset that a lot of the cigar companies were deep discounting to some of the mail order companies. And it was putting brick and mortars on an uneven playing field. They, they were buying their cigars sometimes at wholesale for more than some of the catalogs were selling it for, which put brick and mortars at a huge disadvantage. I mean, all these mom and pop stores, all of a sudden everybody left, oh, I'm going to go buy it from catalog A and catalog mm -hmm. B because it's 50% cheaper. He didn't think that was right. So he created his own cigar distribution company, um, there's some brands that he has um, that are made by major manufacturers, um, you know, Perdomo. Um, not sure if I'm really supposed to say it, but one of them comes out of the Camacho factory. And they're all price protected cigars that will never, ever be in a catalog. So it allows cigar company, cigar stores, brick and mortars to operate on a level playing field. It allows them to have the same chance to sell a cigar at the same profit as somebody in another state or down the road and not have to worry about it being 50% off in a catalog, thus driving business out of the store and basically putting a family out of work. So yeah, he also, it, no, he also it, it, the distribution for Select the Tobacco, which is a company from uh, Nelson Alfonso. And Nelson Alfonso is uh, he's a Cuban artist. He's responsible for the rebranding of the Bahiki. Um, he was the, responsible for the design, and he has his own cigars out. He has uh, Atabe, Byron, and Bandolero. And right now there's a little bit of you know the craze with the Cuban cigar rollers that Duran is uh, using, or you have Hirochi Rabanya. Uh, Nelson Alfonso has been here longer than that. Um, I think Will can attest to the Atabe and how oh, it's a oh. cigar that truly has a wow factor. Yeah, no, I, I smoked the Atta Bay and I gave it a great review because it was a fantastic cigar. And it definitely, you described it perfectly, Barry, in having that, that wow factor. And, you know, we were at the IPCPR this year. Um, we had the best turnout that we've ever had in our booths. Um, so for all the retailers that are listening that came out to support, we thank you. Um, the distribution level for our cigars has grown significantly due to IPCPR 2015. And uh, there are numerous cigar stores that have them. The updated list will be on unitedcigargroup.com as soon as all the orders are processed. So probably come Monday, an updated list of where you can find Bay, Byron, Bandolero, Flor de la Ring, Garofalo, La Giana, and now Kilo, which you guys are smoking. Now, wait, Barry. I thought all those were house brands. No, 100%. <laughs> 100% not. You guys are taking the pre-show now. Uh, <laughs> we were talking about that yeah, before we started the show. Yeah, so, but I, You were bringing up some great points before the show, Barry, and I've, I've dealt with a lot of retailers that have had to overcome this as well, is that the house brands, what people would deem as a house brand cigar, kind of gets a bad name right. um, because, well, explain the differences. I'll, I'll let well, you explain. Well, we do have some house brands, some cigars that are specific to two guys smoke shop. So house you know, brand is one you would sell only in the store, the retail store. store. Yeah. It doesn't get distributed. It doesn't go to other retailers. Yeah. And then uh, United Cigar Group, which is operated totally separately from two guys smoke shop, has brands that are distributed throughout the U.S. I mean, nobody looks at Dion in, in Reno, Nevada and says Illusione is a house brand. Yeah, he sells it in his store, but it has nationwide distribution. Mm -hmm. When Padilla owned a cigar shop in Miami, nobody said Padilla is a house brand. It had nationwide distribution. I think some of the problems that United Cigar has had in the past is that people know that Dave owns three successful shops in New Hampshire, and they think it's a house brand, but it's not. He happens to sell them in his stores, just as Padilla sold Padilla, just as, right, just right. as Dion sells Illusioni, but they're available nationwide. And that's the case with the cigars from United, you know, and, and our full portfolio minus Kilo, which I'm still waiting for 
them to arrive from Nicaragua. I got to tell you something. When I used to work at Miami Cigar, I used to hate having to deal with the Latin American company because they operate under a different time frame. And I'm experiencing it once again. <clears throat> So Kilo, you know, probably be here in two weeks. It'll be added to UnitedCigarGroup.com then, and you'll be able to find out more about the cigar. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping people are enjoying it. I think Coop said that he liked it when he first lit it up. Hopefully he still has that same opinion. Yeah, yeah no, it has, it has. I'm smoking, I, I think, the same cigar that Will is smoking. I yep. don't know if we're smoking the same. Are we smoking the same size, Will? Well, yep, the, the Toro. Okay. Yeah, no, it has fantastic flavor. It's almost like a almost like a graham cracker kind of sweetness that is very persistent throughout. So tell us about uh, Kilo Cigars. All right. So when I originally worked for Miami Cigar and Company, um, they had sent me to go to La Aurora for two weeks to learn about tobacco blending from everything from planting to harvesting to so cure. So you must have met Manuela Noah. Yes, I know Manuel and Noah very well. And He's actually, an awesome guy, awesome guy. He's a totally awesome guy. As a matter of fact, the owner of Havana Cigar Club yes. was part of a retail group that I had taken down to La Aurora for a tour. And uh, he was part of that group as well as uh, Lewis from uh, Bicky Blake's was there. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the, other Havana, the other cigar shop in uh, Rhode Island that has Havana in the name, Habana. Mr. J's Havana Smoke Shop? or Havana Smoke Shop, that's yep. it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I know him very well, but the two weeks that we were down there, you know, I learned how to plant tobacco. I learned how to pick tobacco. I learned how to hang tobacco on the barn. I learned how to ferment the tobacco. I got a crash course in everything cigars. And then the last three days I was there, they allowed me to blend as many cigars as I could. So I wound up blending nine different samples. And then the next day they made me roll all nine different samples. <laughs> oh my goodness. That yes, I had a roll. I had to roll about 400 cigars. Wow. Wow. And I I was surprised because, you know, when I started rolling, they stood there over me thinking I was, you know, here comes the gringo trying to roll a cigar. <laughs> but, you know, only about 10% of what I rolled, they, they had a fix. So I brought them back to Miami. Couldn't get anybody in Miami cigar to smoke one. Brought it into a cigar shop called Neighborhood Humidor. One of the blends, <clears throat> everybody was like, this cigar's great. You got to do something with it. You got to do something with it. Heck, the positive director of sales at that point is like, all right, give me one to try. I'm like, I don't have any more. So we had to get the factory to roll more samples. Miami was sold on it. We released it in Santa Fe, New Mexico, Texas, Baltimore, uh, numerous shops in Florida. And when I left Miami Cigar, Jason Wood, the uh, vice president of Miami Cigars, was nice enough to give me the trademark for Kilo and allowed me to keep the cigar. So wait, so you... <coughs> You did nine different blends? I did nine different blends. And you rolled roughly 400 cigars. I rolled roughly 400 cigars. And then you gave all them out as samples, and you picked this one. Only, one, only one I gave out as sample. Okay. Uh, it was blend number three. Yeah, and that's what became Kilo after Miami that's, gave you the trademark. Right. That's a cool. That's a cool story. I'm glad. I'm glad you you told that story, but, Barry. Because when you get the story behind the cigar, I think it, it increases your appreciation for it and uh, in, increases interest for it too, as well. So that that's really cool. I mean, you were in the trenches, dude. And yeah, the other eight ones I, I rolled, I'll admit, with dog rockets. <laughs> I, I still got some of them, and a year and you know, two years later, I light them up, and they're still dog rockets. <laughs> this one stood out, and you know, yeah. When I was with Miami Cigar, I, you know, I, I love the guys at La Aurora, but I'm a Nicaraguan fanboy. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to do something with Noel Rojas from Guayacan. And uh, Miami was in bed with another manufacturer in Nicaragua. And they couldn't do anything with Noel because it would have created a political nightmare. Why are you going to another factory and not us? Mm -hmm. So when I wound up in New Hampshire, I asked Dave if I could have Noel do the cigar. And Noel and I, when I originally blended the cigar, he knew that I felt something was missing. And the, the wrapper stayed the same, Havana. Uh, it was HVA. Uh, Is it the kilo? You're talking about the kilo, right? The kilo. Yeah. The, the, the wrapper, different, different seeds, but the wrapper basically remained the same. Okay. But binder on the kilo that's out now nationwide is a Corojo 2006, which is a different binder than the original. And then the filler, instead of being a mixture of Nicaraguan and Dominican fillers, the kilo that's out now is 100% Nicaraguan filler. 
That's interesting. You have so there's a Corojo binder on this. It's a Corojo yeah. binder on it. It's a you know Ecuadorian Habano Nicaraguan Corojo 06 binder. Three different types of Lajeros on the filler, um, all from Jalapa, and uh, they're all aged for three years. Yeah, I, I mean it's a. I think strength profile is pretty amped up on this one, as you were saying before. I don't get a lot of spice that I normally get on the that I associate with Corojo type uh, leaf. Well, the reason why you're getting that is the filler, all of it's from Jalapa, and, and tobacco from Jalapa tends to be a little bit sweeter mm. than, say, yep, the, yep. The, the variety grown in Esteli. So the variety grown in Esteli is going to be spicier. It's going to be a little bit more potent. It's going to hurt a little bit more on the retrohale, where on the Jalapa, you'll still get that little bit of that, that tinge, that burn on the retrohale, because it is Lajaro, but you're also going to get the sweetness. And a lot of it has to do with the soil and, and the climate that's that much different in Jalapa versus Esteli. So, Barry, um, I had a, when I was with Dave at IPCPR last year, we were at, we were at a Victor Vitali party. And we got into a real cigar conversation. And one thing that came out of that conversation is that Dave is not a, a strong cigar smoker. N what no. was his reaction when you put this in? I'm kind of curious because this, this is a strong cigar. There's some he there's some power in this hmm. he, he turned green i mean uh, I'm <laughs> yeah. not you, there were a couple of times where i thought he was going to go down to a knee uh but i'll give credit to him i've seen him go past the band on two different cigars and power through it and his words to me were i get it i understand it i see what this cigar is but it's not for me but that's a still a smart guy who's saying, yeah, you know, don't let your personal, you know, you want to sell cigars in the end and make it the, there is a market for obviously this, in my opinion. Um, so that's a smart move by him, too. Yeah, 100%. I mean, this cigar is not for the mild cigar smoker. It's not for the medium bodied smoker. It's for the person that likes the truly 100% full bodied, in your face cigar. Now, when you kind of were changing the blend, or, or modifying them and tweaking the blend, did you kind of wrestle with whether it should be called Kilo, given that there was a Kilo out? Um, and that, by the way, that original Kilo, I have smoked it. It's, it's a, it was an excellent cigar, as, as this is. Or did you? how do you kind of manage that in terms of Kilo 2015 versus Kilo, I'd say, 2012? I, I think because the Kilo 2012 was a limited release, it was always marketed as a test market cigar. And the mm -hmm. fact that I always wanted to do it with Noel from pretty much day one um, played a huge part into me keeping the name Kilo. Um, if it became if if it was more than a limited edition test market release out of La Aurora, if I had never wanted to work with Noel from day one, I probably would have entertained renaming it. Uh, but it's always in, in my mind, this is always where I wanted the cigar to go. Um, you, people liked the test blend that came out of La Aurora enough where it became limited ed edition, but there was always something missing to me. And when I was friends with Noel, the, the blend that's out today, I actually smoked years ago. And no, Noel and I, we both kept it in notebooks. So when it came time to, to come out and I reached out to Noel and Kilo, he's like, yeah, I still have the blend information right here. I said, that's the cigar, let's roll it. And then he told me that he had access to Aganorsa leaf. So he, we changed one of the leaves to, to Aganorsa. And he sent me oh. the samples. And I was like, bingo, this, this, this is Kilo that I envisioned from day one. This is Kilo that you and I smoked by playing dominoes. This is the Kilo that I want to put out. Let me bring these samples to Dave. Dave smoked the sample. Thought he was going to pass out. Thought he was going to go down to one knee, but he green lighted the project. Yeah, I mean, um, and I'll tell you, Noel, for folks who are listening, and I know you noticed know Barry, he is really the, the the next rising star in blenders right now. He he really, uh, he's got his own factory. This guy, this guy's on the right path right now. I think you're going to hear a lot from this man in the next five to ten years. Yep, I love the Garcia family, and this is no slight to. To Jaime, no, no, no slight to Yanni, no slight to, to Pepin himself. But in my mind, Noel Rojas is the next Pepin. You know, when Pepin first came to the U.S. market, nobody really knew whose cigars. He slowly grew. 
Um, here in the Northeast, Glenn Guten was the rep. Um, and eventually he hooked up with Pete Johnson. Tatuaje came on. Next thing you know, Pepin, Pepin is the cigar god. Mm-hmm. I think Noel Rojas with the right backers, the right people attached to his brand, is the next big thing out of Nicaragua. I completely agree. Sorry, so Will. I'm, I'm, busy, I'm busy smoking and drinking here and calling it work. So. Yeah, I'm actually a little yep. bit jealous that you guys are smoking Kilo because I have yet to smoke one with the band on it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, so what are you smoking tonight then, Barry? I, I am smoking the new Atabe Oritos. It is the new 6x55, um, I believe it's a 30-count box, um, 29 of which are you know, naked cigars, foot band, um, the, the traditional Atabe band, and then there's one cigar that comes in that patented tube, the humidified tube that mm. Nelson is famous for. And it has the chambers on the inside of the tube, so it humidifies the whole cigar, not just the foot of the cigar. And then, you know, you can smoke one out of the tube, take the next one out of the box, drop it in the tube. It will stay humidified. Um, you know, some people look at the cigar and say, oh, it's all packaging. It's it's everything. It's, mm. you know, it's the So pack- wait, so what's the price point on the kilo, Barry? <clears throat> the Robusto will sell for $9 mm-hmm. and the Toro will sell for $10. And that's before local taxes. Um, and uh, right now it's just the two sizes. I hope somewhere down the line, <clears throat> if there is success with the brand, to come out with a Corona and uh, either a 56 or a 60. Um, but, you know, I'm going to listen to the market. Mm-hmm. I'm going to listen to what people want. <clears throat> Me, I want something thin. But if you looked at uh, Cigar, in, uh, Cigar Insider this week, <clears throat> they listed the top selling brands, and there was nothing smaller than a 50 ring gauge in the top five. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Now, don't, so when we talk about Atabay, tell people a little bit about Atabay, and that's a much higher, that's a very much a premium cigar. But it, tell us how that came about. Well, it's an ultra premium cigar, and um, if you know anything about the Tainos Indians, um, they would sit around in a circle and they would pray. And the circle would be known as a Cohiba. And they would pray to the leader of, of, the, of the Cohiba, who was known as the Behiki. The Behiki would then take all those prayers, and he would relate them to Atabe. Atabe was the goddess. So you have Cohiba, the circle, Behiki, the head of the circle, and then you have Atabe, which is the goddess. So Cohiba, Behiki, Atabe which puts Atabe on the top. And in my opinion, it's just as good as any Cuban that you will ever smoke, if not a hundred times better. Uh, but we got into a little trouble with that over at Cigar Authority with Dave's trip to Cuba. But I think Yeah, this, I can't say it, we, we all see eye to eye on that. Yeah. So, um, but I think this cigar is as good as pretty much most many Cubans on the market. So oh, yeah, where, where does the tobacco come from for, for Atabe? Well, he does not disclose where the tobacco comes from. He keeps that very secretive. It's made in Costa Rica, um, but he does not disclose what the wrapper, the binder, or the filler is. Um, you know, if you want to assume one thing, it's up to you. Um, it is a light-colored wrapper. Could we call it Connecticut? Could we call it Shade Grown? We could probably call it that, but he won't confirm nor deny. Um, so, unfortunately, there's no way for me to say. It's this, this, and this. It's, he just prefers to keep the blend secret. And what's the price points on the Atabay? The, the Atabays, they run from nineteen ninety nine up to uh, thirty two ninety nine, uh, give or take a dollar, maybe thirty three ninety nine on the Ritos, uh, which is the six by fifty five. Um, so there's four sizes. You got the Divinos, which is four and a half by fifty. The Brujos, which is just under five inches by fifty two. You got the Delarios, which is five and three quarters by fifty-five, and then you got the Ritos, which is six by fifty-five. And and those are, like you said, ultra premium cigars. But I think they, you know, when I smoked them, I thought they lived up to every expectation I would have for an ultra premium. Yeah, yeah Paul Atabe is an Oasis cigar in my book. Um, so that's basically where I throw price out the window and I'll crawl across the desert to get that cigar. Yeah, no, I yeah. agree. Yeah. It, now, Byron Barry is a, another ultra premium cigar in the line, and in my opinion, another great 
great cigar. That 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 is correct. Uh, you know, the the Byron is blended um, to c- Cuban cigars of the nineteenth, twentieth, and what we expect them to be in the twenty first century. Um, it's available in five sizes. You got the Petit Poemus. Uh, you, you got the Poemus. You got the London Asus. And then you got the uh, Grand Paul Amos as well as the Habaneros. And what was that brand again? I'm sorry, just in case our listeners missed it. It is Byron. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've smoked that one yet. Have I smoked? You no, might have. have. You might have. I think you. Yeah, you smoked the Abbey. I think it is a Byron somewhere. I sent you. It, well, but Byron. If you, if you determined that you haven't smoked a Byron, um, I befriended you on Facebook. Just shoot me a message. Let me know. Well, thank and, you. Uh, thank I'll you. be sure to send you a few. That'd be awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you that the Byron slowly, the Byron kind of is a little, I'd say the Atabe is definitely more for, our, it's a more mild cigar. The, the, I'd say that Byron, in my opinion, is more in that medium range. I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, Atabe mild to medium, where uh, Byron is a solid medium. Um, maybe even the, the one that's, the, the new one, uh, the, the Habaneros, is more of a medium to full. Um, so, you know, he's pretty much got everything covered in his brands, you know, depending on what your flavor profile or your strength profile is, I should say. So in my opinion, if you want to try something truly ultra premium, be a mild Atabe, medium Byron or the fuller, even the fuller one, the, the newer Byron, uh, which is the Habaneros. And then you have a third, there's a third line under the selective tobacco portfolio, which is Bandoleros, which I thought was Again, very different. That had a little more spice to it, I thought. it was A, a little bit more spice, a little bit more modern, a little bit um, today's everyday smoker. Um, it's available in two different series. There's Series 2, which has a lighter wrapper, and then there's Series 3, which utilizes a darker wrapper, which makes it a little bit of a uh, stronger cigar. Each one is available in four sizes, and it's, uh, it's a little bit more budget-friendly with the cigars being in the... Uh, We'll round them off. We'll say that they're in the twelve to thirteen dollar range. Um, so if you want to try something that's a little bit more entry level, um, Bandolero would be the way to go. And then if you want to take it to the next level, um, it would be Byron or Atabe or Atabe or Byron. Yeah. In terms of which one right now of the three would you say is in your wheelhouse? Uh, for me, it's Atabe. Um, you know, when I when I drove up to New Hampshire to meet with Dave to start working for him, he gave me a cigar without a band on it, and I lit it up. I got a half inch into it, and I was staring at the cigar, and I was just like, you know, holy, holy crap, what the hell is this? And uh, he told me, what do you think it is? Um, our two guys, we like to play games where we remove the band, give people the cigar, and see if the, the workers can figure out what the cigar is, and... I said to him, I don't know, a Cuban, and he goes, he smiled, and he goes, no, nah, that's Atabe, and I said, this is one of the greatest cigars I've ever smoked, and at that point, he offered me a job. Uh, that was the right answer. <laughs> right right answer. answer. Good thing I didn't say it sucked. <laughs> no, but I mean, like I said, my reaction to it when Dave gave me that cigar uh, was exactly the, the same thing, as I've talked to a lot of people who've discovered that cigar, and, 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 and the Byrons and the Bandoleros. I've talked to people about it, and this was like one of the best kept secrets for the last couple of years. I'm really glad to see, you know, you guys had a great show because I think the the market there is a market. I know they're higher priced, but yeah. you are this. I put up there against any of the super premium cigars up there. They're great cigars. You know, and, and we have to thank you, Coop. You were, you were one of the first guys uh, to review it. Um, also, uh, Seth over at Seth Humidor was one of the first guys to review it. So you were part of the early stages to help get the word out about these cigars. And um, I think the social media presence um, and the cigar bloggers presence helped build the brand uh, where we have had our, you know, our best trade show to date. Um, so on behalf of David Garofalo, I just want to say thank you uh, for believing in the brand, for sharing your thoughts on the brand. You know, People who don't get bloggers, they, they pay an important part to the business. And I truly believe that that community help bring awareness to selected tobacco. No, and I, I appreciate the words that, but uh, it's good to see a lot of other folks have gotten that in the hands because it validates kind of what we thought about that cigar. Sometimes we smoke it, but if someone's not there to validate that, and you've probably seen it the other way around too, 
Yep. It, it's just really they have to just take your word, um, so to speak. So it, I think they validated a lot of things out there about that. Yeah, you know, I think one solid review after another, people just like, all right, you know, I, I got to put this cigar on my radar. And this year at IPCPR, it was on a, it was on quite a few people's radar that, you know, not only was the booth traffic up, um, record sales for the for the uh, for the line at the booth. Uh, we opened up a ton of new accounts, and like I said, it's it's because of social media, or at least what I believe is social media. I'm sure, I'm sure Dave, you know, might think something else or what have you. But you know, I'm I'm a social media guy. Uh, I'm a computer guy, and I believe that you could truly build a brand through social media. Hell, just look at Skip Martin. Um, Chrome X totally built on social media. So I think as you build awareness, you do it. It's the cheapest form of advertising. It's free. And don't dispute yourself, Barry, because when the first kilo came out, I was I was one of the guys down in Chattanooga along with Kip Fisher. Yeah, I, you know, I remember you handed us. A, and Kip is Kip and I are good friends, and we've talked. And I know he's now and down in the DR, and he's chomping probably to get the new iteration of this, which he's going to be really pleased with because. You kept that essence of the strengths, but I really like, like Paul was saying, the sweetness on this cigar. Mm -hmm. um, and the strengths doesn't over, and I say this when it's a really good, strong cigar and it doesn't assault your palate, mm -hmm. that's where you know you, you've hit a good mark there. You definitely, yeah, get, you definitely get a fair amount of nicotine. Whew. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's definitely a kick at the end. And, and I think Jose Blanco reached out to me today to, you know, hashtag name drop. Um, and Jose's been my mentor in, in going from blogger. Um, to the business side of, of tobacco. And uh, he told me he stopped by the booth and he got a sample from Dave and he's back in the Dominican Republic and he lit the cigar up and he goes, boy, is this cigar strong. But for people who will like strong cigars, I think you hit the mark. But even more importantly, I think this is a cigar that will age really well because there's nuances to the smoke that will only get better over time. So I'm curious to see how the cigar ages as it loses a little bit of that strength, a little bit of that nicotine. Um, I think it's smokable right now out of the box, but I'm going to put one aside when I come in, and I'm going to sit on it for <clears throat> at least a few months and see how it progresses as well. You know, and Jose, you know, you know Jose, and I know Jose. He's going to tell it like it is to you. He's not going to sugarcoat that to you. Yeah, um, 100%. I <laughs> when he said that, I definitely breathed a little bit easier. Yeah, he's told me about people who've sent him cigars and, and, he, and feedback he's had. To get, not specific names he's dropped to me, but it's a hard thing sometimes where he has to give that hard feedback. So, um, and Jose's palate second to none, you know, and, and so that's a, that's a real good sign there. So good job. All right, and when they, you know, when they officially come in, you know, you're smoking IPCPR samples. Uh, but when they officially come in, um, I'll make sure I send you a, at least a few for uh, for you to review if you cho choose to do so, or to oh, just okay. enjoy on your own personal time. Whichever you prefer to do is, uh, you know, it's okay in my book. Oh no, appreciate that very, very much. You know, I actually, I so I had a, I got these cigars from Dave at the show, and I put them in my uh, I put them in with some Bobita packs just to, right away to kind of um, make sure that these things stay safe. And then I had to get them to Paul, right? And right. I drove back from IPCPR, and it's Tuesday, and I left IPCPR. I'm like, oh, shoot. I got to <laughs> find an overnighter <laughs> to get this to Paul. <laughs> and I was driving through um, the Panhandle area of Florida, which that was a little bit of an adventure. To, but they yep. made it up to Rhode Island, which is good. So They did. They got here, and it's smoking good. So I was yeah. worried. And, you know, you know, I was expecting these cigars a month ago, and they're still probably two weeks out. Uh, but such is life with doing business with, in you know Latin America. Mm -hmm. yep, yep, yep. You've yep. probably been through that with your days with Miami Cigar, I bet. So. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking at myself in the camera right now, and it's like all black behind me. It I looks like your head's floating, dude. Yeah, I feel like I'm in like Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it does look like that. <laughs> the, the sun went down behind me. It was <laughs> nice earlier, but yeah. oh, now I feel like easy come, easy go. <laughs> <laughs> Will, did you have more questions for Barry? Yeah, I guess... Um, a good, another cigar that I thought was really good was, and I haven't reviewed it yet, was that Flor de Lorraine um, cigar, yeah. the Maduro. Yeah. Flor de Lorraine was, was uh, it, it was blended in the style of LGC. Um, That's, yeah. yeah, you can see it a little, I mean, obviously from the imaging, but the, I can see the taste flow as well. Right, especially on the Maduro. 
and you know it goes it goes all back to price protecting you know that was a cigar that may or may not have been price protected and Flor de Rain is price protected um you know not looking to step on anybody's toes throw anybody under the bus uh but it's a cigar that was blended um to fit the profile of somebody who would enjoy that cigar and it'll allow brick and mortars to sell it at a price that will never be cut, you know, to, to hurt a brand or to hurt another store. So it was something that was just done to protect retailers. Um, the Maduro, uh, specifically the sink size, um, is one of my pretty much everyday smokes. Uh, I smoke six cigars a day, but if I smoked that four, four out of six days a week, that's not an exaggeration. You know, I smoke six days a week, the seventh day, uh, you know, it's the day of rest. So on Sunday, I try not to smoke. I try to, you know, make it a day with my girlfriend in New Hampshire who happens to smoke cigars. Uh, but we try to spend the day, you know, not going to a cigar lounge, rest the palate. But, you know, it is a cigar that has become an everyday smoke for me. It really, it really is. Uh, nice, I really like that Maduro a lot. And it's... Um you know, I know you wrote something about this because it stuck in my head, and I hate throwing anyone under the bus, but the Lagoria Cabanas, were, at one time, they had, I think they have lost something, Barry. I mean, I'm going to agree with you on that. Not saying they're bad cigars anymore, but yeah. you, you, you nailed it on that when I, when I read that. I'm like, yeah, this isn't what I remember anymore. No, nah, I mean, our, our, our profiles evolve. You know, may, maybe our palates evolve. And, it, you know, it may very well be the same cigar. It's just that we've grown up as cigar yeah. smokers. And now it just tastes different to us. Uh, fair comment. That's a very fair comment. But to me, the, the, the Flor de Rain is a throwback. Um, it's a throwback to the cigar the way I remember it to be. Yeah, it's a very, yeah, very good. Um, have you, last question I got is, you know, being a, Paul and I talk about this a lot. So, you know, I'm down in North Carolina. I moved from New York. Paul's up in the Northeast, uh, New England, Rhode Island area, Europe, a little further north. We find that there's brands sometimes that when we relocate or go to different areas that we can't get exposure to, that we oh. kind of suddenly, you know, if we go and if we kind of discover through each other. Have there been any brands that you've discovered maybe in the New England area that you didn't see in New York or Florida that kind of really have taken off with you? Well, first of all, Florida was the worst cigar market in the world. I, I mean, I'm, it is. And I've been down there. I, when you get down to Miami, I agree. You know, you, you got first generation Cubans and they come into a store and they're looking for Monte Cristo. All they want is Monte Cristo. Occasionally you'll get a Romeo and Juliet. So you have cigar stores that are carrying Monte Cristo and Romeo and Juliet. Then you have the second generation Cubans that are looking for Padron. And then you have them also looking for Fuente. Outside of a handful of shops, such as Sabor Havana, such as uh, Neighborhood Humidor, such as, uh, you know, Rhea's Place in, in Coral Gables. Uh, wow, she's going to kill me. I can't remember the name of a shop. And I was there every night for seven, eight months. Cigar seller. Outside of those three shops, and, and we'll throw Neptune in there as well. So outside of those four shops, finding a diversification of cigars in Florida outside of Monte Cristo, Romeo, Padron, and Fuente is virtually impossible. So I couldn't wait as a cigar smoker to get the hell out of Miami. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was brutal. Now, when I come further up to um, New England, there's two brands that, that stand out to me that I haven't seen in New York City and I haven't seen in Miami. One of the, well, three brands. One of them is Icon uh, from the boys. Great, at, great, great cigars. Cigar, yeah. From the yeah. boys at uh, Hammer and Sickle. Um, they got the icon to me, which is very Ashton esque. It is a smooth, creamy, milder cigar. They released the Maduro at the trade show. They're coming out with Kalanok. Uh, I saw which that. Is, yeah, which is a peat. It's a cigar that is cured in peat. Um, Paul, so, I, I so got that cigar, Paul. Yeah. So I haven't smoked it yet. Yeah. If you're, to try Paul, it. you're a scotch drinker, correct? Yes. If, I don't know if you're a fan of peaty scotches. But Every this, once in a while, I do like them, yeah. This cigar is, I don't want to say it's peat infused, but it's cured in, you know, they use peat to cure it, you know, kind of like the, 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 the bourbon barrel aging or whatever. 
In this case, it's peat. So if you like a peaty scotch, it's a cigar specifically designed for that. Um, also up here, I've seen a lot of uh, Tortuga, uh, which is Victor Vitali's burning. Um, I know too, yeah. And, you know, Dave, my apologies. Uh, but also 724 I've seen up here, which was a brand that started in New Hampshire. Um, so those are three brands that I see up here that I didn't see in New York and I didn't see in Florida. Um, <clears throat> you know, Icon and Tortuga, they're just great brands. Very, very, very true. I mean, um, I just smoked <laughs> Victor's Connecticut for the first time at the show, Paul. But there's some coming your way. Nice. Uh, a classic, classic throwback Connecticut. Coop, let me let me turn the tables on you. Got a curiosity. What's big in your area that you didn't that you don't see? Because you travel. You know, I've right. I've sat and had a cigar with you in Staten Island, New York. I've sat yeah. and had a cigar with you in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I've sat and had a cigar with you in West Palm Beach, and I've sat and had a cigar with you in Miami. What's in your neck of the woods that you don't see anywhere else? Very interesting. So for a while, a big cigar line down here was Lou Rodriguez. Unfortunately. He went out of business. You know, he was based in North Carolina. Um, Sean Williams, Premier Mundo, uh, is pretty big in the southeast, given that he's in Atlanta right now. Right. He's doing some really, really good stuff with um, El Titan de Bronze, PDR Cigars. Um, now he's working with es Espinosa down there. Um, so, I mean, those are the two, I would say, that really stand out that um, – that we don't see um, a lot. You know, we see a lot of that. I when I go to other places, and Casa Fernandez would be the third. Yeah. Um, I just know from talking to Paul, there's not a lot of Casa Fernandez up there. Up here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and same up here. So. Yeah, I'm I'm fortunate to be near a lot of shops here in Rhode Island. If I want, you know, Davidoff or Fuente, I can go to actually multiple shops that carry them. Uh, Roma Craft is is big uh, up here in, in, uh, in Mr. J's. Uh, I can go, you know, next door and get Elohio and Falto uh, are two of the brands that are exclusive to him, to him next door. So there's a lot of different brands that, that I have access to um, that maybe others don't. Um, I know I send Phil a lot. I mean, I send Will, rather, a lot of uh, uh, Fuente because it's not as big in his area. So. It's tough to get Fuente where in Charlotte, yeah. You mentioned Falto when I blended the original Kilo. The last day I was at La Aurora, the last day I was doing blending. Louis Falto was there because Falto cigars were made at La Aurora, and he gave me a little bit of insights too. So he played a role in my education, nice, my nice. blending education. Really, really nice guy uh, from Puerto Rico. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah that twentieth anniversary is a top ten cigar this year. Oh, it's one of yeah, that it's thing is one awesome. of the best he's done. Yeah, I'll have to look for it because I haven't tried it yet. Excellent. <clears throat> uh, so Barry, are you ready to play five questions with the Stogie Geeks? A hundred percent. Three words to describe yourself. Opinionated. Nah. Faulty. <laughs> humorous. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? A blowtorch. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Oh, wow. Uh, wow. Um, uh, cigar smoking, man. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? First. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. <sighs> Morgan Fairchild and Pierce Brosnan. There you go. Well, Barry, thank you very much for appearing on the Stogie Geeks. Of course, you can uh, uh, read Barry's blog post and see him on the Cigar Authority show as well. So, Barry, thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. Barry. Just briefly, um, Coop, I know we invited you up to come to New Hampshire. Uh, we would love to have you a guest on the Cigar Authority. Uh, Paul, if you feel like making the trip from Rhode Island, um, that invite, we would love to have you as well. Uh, come up, spend the day with us, be a guest of uh, David Garofalo, Mr. Jonathan, Chuck Morrison, and myself over at the Cigar Authority. It's on my bucket list, dude. We've been I, talking I, I about believe, it. Yeah, I can't believe we, I live that close and I haven't been up there. I've, I've always want, Everyone always talks about how great Two Guys Smoke Shop is. I listen to the Cigar Authority, so I can't wait to come up and visit you guys. I know the first cigar will be on Dave, but the second cigar will be on me. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Sweeten care, the offer. And, and I, I appreciate you uh, allowing me to ramble. <laughs> no worries. Thanks, Barry. It. Take care. Hey, Barry, stay on the line one second. Sure. Okay. 
And with that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and talk about our debonair ideal segment where we will discuss IPCPR cigar etiquette. Stay tuned. <laughs> 